Welcome everybody uh, to our second guest lecture of the semester. I'm very excited about it. Remember, you wanna follow LAMC AMP Instagram. This is also gonna be streamed on our LAMC AMP YouTube page. So if there's things in this talk that you, you know, wanna go back and rewind and see again, you can do that on our LAMC YouTube page. Um, so that's a good way to go. And you know, following us on Instagram, you're gonna know about all the events that we have this semester. We have a bunch of really great events coming up. Uh, and um, you know, it's kind of nice to be back in person, sort of, right? To have these kind of things. It's also nice to have people at home on YouTube watching this as well. Uh, so tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you guys Dion Johnson. So I know all about Dion. He and I are longtime friends, but I'm gonna read off my phone a little bit so I don't screw things up. Um, so Dion received her, his Master of Fine Arts at Claremont Graduate University in 2000. Uh, before that, he got his Bachelor of Fine Arts, Fine Arts at Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio in 97, and was part of the Yale Norfolk Summer School of, of Music and Art in Norfolk, Connecticut in 96. Dion is a LA-based artist. His paintings uh, combine and explore dynamic opposites, expansiveness and compression, surface and depth, and darkness and light. Gradient color fields are juxtaposed to and interwoven with planes of precise hard edge abstraction. These color fades are both intimate and vast. They may reflect internal moods with wandering thoughts and insightful realizations, or they may suggest vivid sunsets on, on the Mercury, on Mercury or Mars. That would, okay, <laughs> that's, I like that. With chemical skies and radiant perspectives. The hard edge shapes seem to reach up and stretch down. Their elongated curves, interlocking contours, and bold colors allude to kinetic sensations in evolving environments. So Dion currently shows at three galleries across the United States. So he shows at Bentley Gallery in Phoenix, Contemporary Art Matters in Columbus, Ohio, and currently has a solo exhibition at Holly Johnson Gallery in Dallas, Texas, where he also shows there as well. Uh, so. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dion Johnson. Thank you. And can we hear fine from this microphone now? OK, good. Um, thank you very much, Curtis. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just say, um, as I'm uh, talking and going through images, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And I would love to hear from you. Sometimes that just is a good way to promote like how we're talking and make it more specific to you guys. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, my studio practice from approximately 2001, which is shortly after my graduate studies, to present. This is my studio. Uh, this is my wife, Inka. And uh, she perfectly matches my artwork. When, whenever she wears clothes, it's like magic, right? Um, <laughs> Now, here's what my studio looks like when I'm working. These are two paintings in progress. There's a lot of uh, paint mixed up in containers. There's uh, straight edges and notes and measuring tapes and tools and tables. I like to keep, you know, two turntables going. You know, you got to DJ that and get it just right so that, you know, your work feeds off each other. This is an example. It's actually a detail of an earlier painting around 2000. Um, 2001, and um, you know, I think it's important to sort of show that there is this idea of rendering and realism and fascination with color in objects, but the uh, sort of luminous yellow orange and then those sort of subtle sort of pinkish peach bands of color are this abstraction that's starting to emerge from that. This is a you know sort of medium large painting, um, approximately six feet across. And it's this sort of blue, sort of almost um, kind of fluctuating atmosphere. And when we zoom in on it, we can sort of see this activity. This painting is named Cycle. And so the idea of these uh, images and elements sort of intermixing, like there's some sort of system happening of the, these triad dots that seem to be sort of sprinkled like precipitation. And then you see this actual spray from a spray gun in the upper left corner. So sort of mixing that illustration of something, the actual effect of something, you know, in this sort of liquid um, kind of natural sort of misty environment, you see flowers dangling down. And then within that sort of 
really sort of juicy brushstroke that seems to be like frozen momentum in the center there, there is a raincoat and umbrella as though in this sort of wet environment, there's the uh, tools to navigate through this and sort of explore what this painting feels like. And so those allusions to narratives and how sort of line work and, and color field and just, you know, pure um, sensations of brushstrokes was really what I was interested in at this time. I would say uh, one of my biggest influences is Paul Clay. Um, he was a painter from the Bauhaus, and this is a painting named Ventriloquist. And so you can see some similarities to how he's using line drawing and imagery and incorporating it into this sort of grid of color. And in his painting, there's this sort of figure standing on an imaginary stage, and you see these um, sort of animals, maybe make-believe animals inside of him as though he can conjure their voice or their personality and project them outward. Side by side, I think you can kind of see how, you know, here's someone who's, you know, from art history of a certain time period, but, you know, um, there is a lot of overlap in the interest in how the painting is made and also how there's a playful narrative involved. This is a painting from maybe 2006 or seven. Um, I would say it's about four feet tall, six feet across. And uh, the name of this one is Interloper. And so the idea of like how to look at a painting, what are the perspective elements of a painting? I'm always sort of interested in like, how are we looking at something or what is this space? And the idea of an owl, sort of the perfect night predator with night vision, sort of looking out at you and the camera view, the sort of viewfinder in that uh, sort of lime green is like uh, night vision through like um, techno goggles or something. And so this idea of like, are we in a place that's welcoming or lurking in the shadows is I think amplified more when we see the razor wire, although it's sort of like ribbons, almost like the way you'd wrap a present, it's still this sort of dangerous element sort of flowing along those looping brush strokes on the side there. I would say this painting is at a point where I felt like I was not running out of options, but certainly the idea of using imagery was sort of narrowing down for me, like, you know, birds, flowers, those things are recurring through here. And what I became more interested in, if we sort of zoom in on this lower part, is how those elements of like stripes and bands of color and brush strokes and glazes uh, are starting to become a more um, important pictorial element. So as when there was that little bird before uh, with a sort of uh, background of stripes and color field, now I'm sort of interested in this. So shortly thereafter, I had a, a studio visit with a, a friend of mine, a curator, who saw that while I had finished paintings like Interloper, there were other canvases like unfinished in my studio. And, and she really made the comment of like, well, what's going on with these? I'm like, oh, they're just getting started. And, and she said, well, you know, I was in New York recently and had some, some galleries and some visits to some artists and things. And, you know, this looks really fresh. I mean, there's something going on here. And so I sort of gave myself a challenge to make uh, uh, several paintings. This is about 40 inches across by about 20, 22 inches tall. And uh, to just use like seven colors with the rule being they had to have uh, reached the top and bottom. And if they were on the sides, they would, they would reach the sides as well. And how much could I accomplish with that? And what would color mean? So with this painting, it's named uh, Mr. K. And um, the reason is, um, while there are like different sensations in this, the way that, you know, that lime seems like that, like awesome popsicle lime, that sort of like sweet, sour taste, um, or maybe other colors feel more like uh, the sky or um, some sort of a uh, sort of velvety texture in that like burgundy in the center. It was the, the blue that made me want to title it Mr. K because it is a, uh, a direct reference to Yves Klein, who was a French artist uh, from Nice. And he actually, um, well, he was really cool. He was like a martial arts expert. He used a flamethrower to make art sometimes. He was, he was you know, uh, a real showman in that regard. But um, he uh, created a color, a pigment, and patented it called Yves Klein Blue. And it's this very sort of deep, very saturated sort of cobalt blue. And because this painting seemed like, wow, I've never used blue that sort of cool and that sort of like stunning and, and bright before, I titled it Mr. K. 
Then things became more complicated. I started to layer again, sort of almost sort of starting from scratch and having a base of colors to sort of work with. I could layer things, but they wouldn't necessarily be images, but they would be related to reality. There would be um, allusions to you know, things we experience in the world. And this one is named Arrow, like aerodynamics. And just to sort of show you that this isn't totally unrelated to our environment or, or how we see the world, this is the um, metro stop uh, close to where I live. And I, I really I took this picture and I really liked the idea that there's um, the sunset, there's, there's um, artificial light from headlights, from the, the street lamp. There are these lines happening that are very sort of like designed and crisp, architectural, the wires and things. But then there's also this sort of like, you know, lens flare color, these sort of magentas and blues sort of like melting together. And so I think you can see all of those colors more or less happening in that painting uh, named Arrow on the right. And this is a installation from an exhibition that I had uh, in Texas. So you get a sense of the scale. Um, there was a, uh, uh, a writer that wrote about the piece Arrow and the um, sensation that they described was like being in an airplane as it starts to take off and you start to see looking out the window this sort of tilting and this sense of like, you know, losing gravity and gaining momentum. Here is, just to give you another idea of the studio, a quick little video. I think it's helpful to sort of put these in to see how the paintings are made. While they do look very sort of digital and graphic, they're goopy, they're messy. There's a lot of masking tape involved and cleaning tools. But there you get a sense of, you know, how they're sort of coming together. This is a painting called Vampire Mirror. Um, sort of a larger painting for me. It's 60 inches by 80 inches. It's actually two canvases put together. Um, once paintings get so large, uh, I'll sort of section things and make them modular so they fit out the door and things like that. There's a practicality to it. Um, and I like the idea that this is mostly white, but it's not empty, it's considered. And, um, you know, if anyone is into vampires or, you know, the, you know, the Dracula myth and things like that is they don't have a reflection. So the idea that like there's something that's attractive about this painting, the colors are bright, but there's very sharp edges that feel almost needle-like or dangerous or fang-like. And as, if there was a vampire standing in front of it, you wouldn't know it. You might just be fascinated by the colors and drawn in and it's, you know, sort of something, you know, sneaky and visible. This painting is um, influenced by architecture, you know, not in the way the era was with the Metro stop, but this is an archway at Red Fort, which is in Delhi in India. So there are these connecting um, courtyards and architecture and the, all these sort of link structures together. And as I was walking through, I sort of looked up and the, um, you know, uh, influences of like uh, Hindu and, and Muslim architecture, these sort of mathematical formulas that sort of create these patterns, it was, it was almost like when I was looking up, it felt like I was sort of floating up, even though architecture or the stonework is very heavy, the arches and the points was just like this moment of, um, you know, feeling so sort of light and airy and sort of like getting a sense of vertigo. And so I think that amount of white with the sort of Christmas crispness of the design of the arches was uh, very influential to the painting um, Vampire Mirror. Here it is in an exhibition in New York on the right, and the painting on the left is sort of a long painting. It's 12 feet across. It's uh, named Feel the Sky. And so the idea that I'm not painting landscapes, but the sense of looking up at the sky, like maybe as there's um, sort of a really saturated sort of blue, but then later in the day, it becomes much lighter as, as the sun and the time has changed and the shadows are different. And the sort of like shifting in of those diagonals and shifting out feels like the passage of time. It feels like wind sort of pushing and moving clouds. Any questions so far? Yes. Oh, yeah. So um, 
in terms of like the tools that you use, you were using a spatula earlier for your um, for your line work. Is that the main tool? Do you use um, brushes at all? Very good question. Um, I use brushes infrequently. Um, they are useful at times, but primarily I'll use like putty knives or drywall tools, spatulas to sort of get the paint onto the surface and then the, the knives and different um, straight edge devices to sort of smooth things out because I actually don't want there to be brush strokes. There's something, I mean, in the earlier work you saw them, but with these pieces here, something about having the color be as sort of pure and surface to be as smooth as possible, there's an immediacy to that. I don't want to get sort of tied up in the gesture of all these sort of like you know, uh, brush strokes and these sort of like little sort of nuanced moments that draw you in. I want my paintings to blast out at you. And so I choose the right tools for that. And in addition to that, I use a lot of spray guns. So the blues in the, in the painting um, that we see here are spray applied with an air compressor, sort of like how you'd paint a car with this sort of big sort of top loaded, you know, it's, um, a very effective way to get a lot of paint on the surface very evenly. And so thinking about practical things, thinking about like, you know, how these are sort of like industrially made, but when you get up close to them, because there is these translucencies and these sort of like intricate moments of where colors overlap, they are sort of very personal as well. Does that answer your question? Coolly cool, good question. Okay. Side note. Side note. Um... Man, I'm blanking. Um, oh, yes. For like the taping and the process of that, how like do you just remove the tape carefully? Do you use a very specific type of tape? Because I've used tape on my pieces and damaged. Um, oh. But just like how, uh, you know, are you just extra careful? You know, painter's tape, a very different kind of tape, kind of stuff like that. Oh, I love this. We're talking tech stuff. Um, no, I'm very particular about my materials and process. Um, the way that the canvas is primed is there are uh, maybe four coats of gesso on it and that is lightly sanded and there's about four coats of spray applied uh, white paint on top of that which is sort of gently sanded so that the surface is very sort of strong. Um, if uh, I were to use maybe like a store-bought canvas or someone else's preparing it a different way if I were to apply this I think is called high adhesion production 3M tape um, it might peel up that that first layer or it might sort of cause damage because there's that that those first few layers aren't sort of sealed in in such a way but you know I've sort of learned through making mistakes and getting to the end of a painting and messing one up it's like oh okay note to self next time I need to adjust and sort of refine my practice and that and that has happened so um, sometimes I will use the, the blue tape, which is I think called painter's tape you're referring to, but I prefer to have the tan tape um, because I can sort of seal it more easily. And um, it's also, I think, just sort of like, I kind of learned how to use one material a certain way. And if I wanted to change, I would learn how to do that, but it's been a good thing and I'm sticking with it. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Let's move on. This is the same exhibition. Um, and um, for this side of the gallery, I did a sort of uh, vinyl adhesive uh, in, in sort of two different patterns to create this uh, mural. And on top of the mural, I hung uh, five framed paintings on paper. I wouldn't necessarily call them drawings because they're painted in the same way, but simply uh, mounted and, and framed. And I thought of, um, you know, the entire installation as like a like a carousel. The idea of I want it to be sort of fun and this sort of like um, environment. And I think I have yes, a video here. And so, if a carousel goes around and the lights are flashing, you see the other uh, horses going sort of up and down, and there are these individual moments as a part of the whole. I thought that as you sort of scan across this and you see the vertical axes of the design of the, of the uh, wall application and then these moments of the individual drawings that that sort of gave the effect of, of a merry-go-round. This is, uh, the painting is called Encounter. 
And the two pieces, uh, the sculptures, which are, you know, maybe soccer, by, soccer ball sized, are, um, those are called molecule. I made five of them. I like the idea that, um, and sometimes like I'll make things because there is an exhibition or, or a gallery has an idea or, or I'm a part of like another group, something or other. And so I was asked, can you make an addition? And could you make an addition that's 3D? And I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I'm up for the challenge. That's one of the fun things about being an artist is inventing things and trying new things. And so with the uh, molecule pieces, I sort of thought like, well, you know, what if one of my paintings got you know, sucked into a wormhole and it wasn't a flat plane anymore? What if it sort of evolved into some sort of way that it sort of collapsed in on itself and could kind of regenerate and become something different? And in that way, I thought, well, let's look at some of these geometrical things. And, you know, I wanted to work with the uh, 3D printer with, with this lab in my I, I teach at a university, and they sort of figured out I, this little joint system, if I could put these triangles together, I could sort of create these. And so sort of the fun and the challenge of that was like, well, let's see what happens. And, you know, uh, I don't make sculpture all that often. I don't make like large installations or murals all that often. But when I do, I it, it think really reinforces what the paintings are and sort of shows the paintings in a different light. And so I really like how there's a dialogue between the three-dimensional pieces here and the painting encounter behind it. This is a piece uh, named Time Travel. It's a, it's a rather large painting. It's 10, 10 feet across. And I made it shortly. I made it shortly after returning from Nepal, where I was uh, with uh, my wife and our friend, and we went hiking in the Himalayas on the Annapurna Trail. And um, I assure you, I made the painting before sort of figuring out what it was. But I will sort of show you, like, what I understood it to be after it was completed by by. Well, here we'll see. Um, about I think day four or five on uh, hiking, uh, we we woke up at this um, lodge and we had breakfast and we started hiking for the day and we started going like up this sort of steep trail. You can see the buildings there on the on the um, that's where we had spent the night. And uh, as the morning light was sort of coming across the uh, the the mountains that sort of receding into space, um, I just really saw my painting in a way that like these um, arches, there's uh, sort of a, a yellow into white and then a, a blue and then a white into magenta and then a sort of a, a magenta into black, you know, sort of like echoing that re repetition, that curvature in the photograph of, of the landscape. And so thinking about the yellow as being that bright morning light and, and that being the start of the day and the piece reading like a timeline from left to right, from the beginning in the morning to, to the evening. So this would be that morning light, that yellow on the left-hand side. Somewhere in the middle, as we're sort of hiking along, we're going across this bridge and it was, so, you know, this sort of like tight wire bridge and you've got this beautiful view, almost like there's nothing below your feet uh, of the running water and you got to see, you know, the other side of sort of like turned around and the, the snow on the mountains, that's where the, the base camp is as people ascend, you know. And um, so that sort of white and blue and that sort of really refreshing sort of like the sound of the water, that the moisture, um, I think really gets to that cool part. So you go from that hot morning sunlight into this sort of cool sort of flowing curves and blue and white. About halfway through the day and every day that we were hiking, we had a wonderful guide. And it was a wonderful experience meeting people. You would often stop for tea or there were like shops where there was jewelry and, and all these sort of different like wonderful things to sort of buy along the trail. And I loved how everything was organized. Like there's a certain like way items are displayed on shelves at Target. And that is not how items are displayed for purchase when you're hiking in Nepal. And so these ordered rows of things, I felt as though the bottom edge in the center of this painting, the, how those colors sort of stack and situate and are organized very tightly along that bottom edge there, really um, are reflective of how the, the jewelry, the necklaces and earrings and things were laid out for display. As the day continues, um, it gets cooler and cooler. And at the very beginning, in the morning, our guide said, do you see there and then over there and see that red? He was pointing to this lodge. He goes, we're going to be there in about 
six and a half or seven hours. And so there's this, this lodge, and um, you can see that the shadows uh, on the ground there. Uh, Christy on, on the right is, you know, has some chai tea, which was delicious. And so as you get to the right edge of this painting, it's a resting point. It's where we sort of come for the evening. There's the red of the lodge. And um, it's, it's sort of beautiful to sort of sit and watch the sunset, have some tea. And then the little last sliver of black is, is nightfall. So in this way, I like to think of you know, abstract paintings as having you know, narratives that, that sort of fuel them. And they might not be immediately evident, but it's, it's life experiences. It's you know, how we sort of like put something into a painting to get it started. And it's expressed through color, shape, and design. And there it is. And at an exhibition in Los Angeles, so you can see the scale of it. I think I'm gonna, yeah, shift gears now. I want to show you an exhibition that I curated last year at Contemporary Art Matters, uh, a gallery in Columbus, Ohio that, that Curtis had mentioned. Uh, I was invited by the gallery to curate an exhibition. They said, um, Dion, how would you feel about putting your work in a show with other painters from Los Angeles that you feel you relate to? So again, like the sculpture and some other things, I said, yeah, sure, I'm up for the challenge. This will be fun. Let's, let's see my work in that context. Let's, let's invite my friends. And you know, I had to um, write about the show. I was, the, I was the curator, and I had to have like an idea of like, well, I have to come up with the title, Flying Colors, and um, you know, sort of tie it together. And I thought of the works as like a conversation with one another, but then also, if someone says, well, why abstract painting? I thought, well, yeah, why? Well, what can, what can painting do? And, and that's where I thought about like, you know, paintings are like superpowers or magical, or they can do things that we don't expect. And this is a painting uh, by, by Heather Gwen Martin. And um, I think because of her piece, I came up with the title Flying Colors. This is a small, I think maybe 21 inches across painting, but it feels so large. It feels as though the, the red shapes and the blue are equal parts like propeller blades that are spinning out of control and liquid that seems to be expanding out from the center point. So that idea of um, weightlessness, fluidity, but yet there's these tails, these sort of blue and red, and there's a black sort of one sort of um, growing out there as well. These appendages that seem to be extending and then breaking off. Like the whole painting is a living organism as though we can kind of step back and see the thing grow and take flight. And so thinking like, well, yeah, this, this painting can fly. It's, it's, it's weightless. It's, it's, it's got this like wonderful power and this like idea and momentum. And so moving on, this is a painting by Michael Reef Snyder, and it is titled uh, Swami's Break, which is uh, uh, an area in, in San Diego along a beach. And to think about how his paintings, um, while he and I paint very differently, he's using these sort of wet and wet, sort of very sort of rich textures. The way we think about color and sensation, I think, are very similar. And to title a piece after a place uh, where water is splashing up on the rocks and there's sunlight reflecting on the waves and you almost feel the spray of the water, I think is really expressed in this painting. This is a painting by um, Pamela Jordan. And um, it's, a, it's a circle. So, um, you know, I remember being in her studio and saying like, I know we paint really differently. You have these sort of stained, sort of bleeding colors into colors, but I feel a really strong connection. And, and she sort of said like, oh, well, yeah, you're making like these curves with your masking tape, but the shapes of my canvases are curved. And sometimes she does irregular curved shapes. Sometimes they're circles like this. And I was like, oh, right, yeah, I get, yeah. Yeah, I see that. But with this piece specifically, which is called Blue Arc, I remember sort of seeing it and, um, you know, it's sort of medium size, maybe I think 30 inches across, thinking that, you know, it reminded me of um, 
a marble, like a sort of a cat's eye marble. Like when I was a kid, I had, you know, these, these cool glass spheres and I would, I would hold them with my eye and look through them. And, you know, as I was thinking like, wow, this painting's like drawing me back to childhood and thinking about how fascinating it was to sort of like see that color suspended in glass and how sort of like wonderful um, that moment was. But then at the same time, as, as I'm looking at this, you know, these colors sort of morphing in and, and sort of like mixing into one another, it feels like this almost gaseous atmosphere, like, uh, like, you know, sort of thinking about like, well, there's this other part that it could be a marble sphere, but it could also be like the planet Jupiter. And then all of a sudden I'm thinking about like a gazillion miles away, like orbiting around the surface of another planet and wanting to explore what these strange colors of clouds are. And in that way, that sort of, the, the painting is titled Blue Arc, you sort of see this sort of counterclockwise and clockwise movement sort of happening, these um, apertures and sort of like, you know, radial movements happening, like rotation, revolution, and drawing us in. And so the idea of like, you know, time travel back to childhood or thinking about space exploration was, was how I thought about her work. And lastly, this is um, Rima Galoom. This is a, a small painting and it's titled Lovers. And I like the idea that this feels like, you know, like romantic chemistry colors mixing together in this shadowy space. You can think of a intimate moment, you know, you know, at night where there's, you know, a moment where, where you really connect with someone where it is magical. And I think the way these sort of colors come together and embrace each other and mix together, like we think about, I have good chemistry with someone. I think that's what's happening in this painting. It's like a stage, but it's also this really sort of quiet, personal, and intimate moment as well. And this is my painting, obviously. And I felt too self-conscious to write about my own work. I was like, well, I could write about everyone else's, but then I don't want to be like, and then my work is. So fortunately, I asked my friend um, Liat uh, Yosifer, who's also an LA painter, if she could just write a little bit about this. And I switched the idea from what can a painting do, like uh, make you think about childhood, think about flying, or you know, think of a place like, like Swami's Break, and thought about what, what can a painting be? And in that way, the painting can be an invitation. It can be an invitation to participate in a group exhibition and have like your painting share this conversation, or it can be an invitation to have another painter friend of yours come into your studio and, you know, she can, well, I'll just tell you what she says about my painting. Uh, Dion Johnson's painting, Activate, is sleek, polished, and intact, but only until it starts to reveal its cubist tendencies. In this world of planes and lines, I want to be lost in the magnificent manganese blue sky that is on the right side of the painting, but at the same time, I find myself busy undoing the folding sharp stripes to its center left. The colors in the center left are jarring yet playful, organized into an accordion-like shape, packed tightly, holding a level of stress within. The more I look, the more the blue flawless sky to the right of the painting emerges as a picture of happiness. However, the picture of perfection is interrupted by these emotional edges and corners that don't belong in a beautiful, curvy, and sunny California sky. This duality parallels my anxieties about perfection and beauty in humans, in nature, in painting, and in the city where it was made. I want to sing to glossy surfaces, but I also ask why such elation and beauty must come into viewing in pieces. I think that Dion Johnson is walking me into this dream about beauty, but also acknowledging that I might feel broken in front of it. So, man, Liat, thank you. <laughs> How awesome. And maybe you can start to see some of that. Um, maybe it changes like the way we get to look at paintings when we hear other people, you know, describe their experiences and it becomes a rich and sharing experience. This is a, a sort of large-ish painting um, titled Kite. There's a Stephen Malcolmus song titled Kite. And I was listening to that a lot. Paul Clay was interested in music. Another influence of mine is Stanley Whitney. He listened to a lot of Miles Davis during a certain time period when he was making paintings. And so to think about paintings as being influenced by sound is another experience, not just traveling to different places, but where we are in our head with sensations of music. 
But the, the, the title uh, kite kind of comes from starting on the left side and taking off. There is this sort of up sort of notion from that uh, magenta sort of leading you into the painting from the lower left corner, darkness into light. And there seems to be a twirling or a sort of like climbing and diving, a gliding and floating that happens across the painting as you move to the right side. There is this moment of, I think, a uh, 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 broad open space where it, the sky does open up, like it's this sort of perfect moment where the activity is sort of calm, almost meditative. And then it comes to a quiet close at the lower right hand corner. So thinking about like, you know, a landscape, not as a landscape, but how a kite might travel through the sky and how that relates to maybe landscape painting. This is a painting titled Tightrope. And the title doesn't have anything to do with what influenced me. I thought it was just a good way to think about like the tension of these like sort of, you know, parallel sort of center structures sort of guiding you up in this activity that seems to be balanced just so, but not necessarily rigid, like it sort of breathes and flexes and allows that, you know, dark upper right corner to be in perfect balance with that light lower left corner, sort of finding a, a point of, of being in its perfect space. But I will tell you, it's influenced by visiting um, uh, Japan, specifically the Fushimi Gates in Kyoto. Um, anyone ever been to Japan? Yeah, cool. I, I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed being in this specific area where there are stairs and, um, you know, all these different uh, ways of going through this park that are gates after gates after gates of this sort of like, um, you know, reddish orange. And you see the light sort of filtering in from your periphery, and you're sort of walking through this sort of tunnel of color that feels so luminous. And in that way, I knew that there would be some sort of pain that came out of it because it was just so stimulating. It was so memorable and so enjoyable. I mean, I really want my paintings to be about exploration. I want them to be about pleasure. I want them to be about memory, all of these things. And that came together in this piece. Oh, here's another um, quick little uh, movie. Um, this is called Intersecting Energy, obviously, and it is a public mural. Let me just hit play. My... Um, <clears throat> was invited to do this public art project. And I was asked to write a little bit about it. So for me, intersecting energy translates time, movement, and emotion into layers of color that progress across the walls. Slender shapes of and colors seem to suddenly appear and quietly dissolve as they slip behind and peek out from five prominent rectangles. The geometry, so sorry, I couldn't read fast <laughs> enough, it alludes to imaginary buildings and the changing colors of different times of day. That's my aunt that you saw walk by there. She, she joined me. She, she lives in Columbus to, to go see it. So it was really fun to do something and, you know, to see people taking selfies in front of it and that that becomes part of the neighborhood in between a park and, and, and sort of a, a busy sort of um, city area where there's lots of like shops and restaurants and things. Um, this is sort of a large-ish painting. It's uh, titled Wish. It's um, six feet tall by eight feet across. And, um, you know, I think uh, maybe similar to uh, time travel, you can enter in from one side and make a way across. Um, it's not necessarily about a story, but I like the idea that there are so many possibilities in it and it can feel like so many different things, like different times of day, um, like there's surprises that emerge from it. This is different than uh, time travel in that this has 
many, I think up to this point, the most amount of like gradients and overlapping um, uh, fades and transparencies where colors seem to sort of disappear and emerge from. And the idea of wish is like anything can happen. Hey, look, there's me. I was giving a gallery talk, this was a part of a show, and they said, oh, could you talk about this one? And so I'm trying to remember what I said back then, but I like the idea that there are all these possibilities in a painting and that you can wish about something and imagine and, and think about paintings and art that way. And this is an exhibition it was part of. Um, there's another painting of mine in the corner there, and on the other corner is a painting by Michael Riefsnyder, who we saw in the previous show, who made the ocean painting called Swami's Break. And there's the painting there. I think it's sort of fun to see paintings in that context and how they can sort of talk to and have relationships with other artists. Uh, this painting is called Natural. Um, it's a five feet tall, six feet across, to give you a sense of scale. Um, this is honestly one of my favorite paintings that I've made recently. I made this maybe about a year ago. And, you know, I've talked about my work in terms of like experiences or sensation or, or, or landscape. And for me, I, I, I sort of made this and, and figured out sort of what it felt like later in that it's a bit like a canopy, like if you're um, you know, going for a hike or you're in a forest and you see trees and all the different levels of leaves and branches and there's sunlight coming in but there's shadows at the same time, sort of like seeing through layers and experiencing like those greens and those sort of natural colors sort of like coming together and being filtered through sunlight and shadow. Uh, here's another um, look around my studio. I think sometimes it's, it's fun to see like how works that are made at a, a certain time relate to one another. Like at the beginning of, of the presentation, I showed you two works in progress. And so now here's a, a group of paintings that are all finished around the same time. A question that people often ask me, and I'll, I'll preempt you so none of you ask it, is how long does it take to make my paintings? And the answer is I paint as fast as I can. If you're good at something, you should be able to do it well, you should be able to do it efficiently. And so, you know, the paintings that you see here were all probably made in about, like, maybe a period of five months. Yes? No, 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 sure. all, all of them together. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, big ones take longer, smaller ones go faster. That kind of makes sense. And Dion, you're making them concurrently too. You're not just working on one painting at a time. Oh, Sometimes good question. Um, usually there's two canvases going at once or, or I'm drawing on my computer to figure out what the next one will be while paint is drying. There's a lot of ways in which you can work on things simultaneously if it's in the planning stage or the execution stage. Oh, well, there it goes again, I need to do that. Um, Curtis had mentioned that I have an exhibition up presently. This is Dallas, Texas. I thought it'd be fun to show, um, you know, different views of the gallery here so you get a sense of it outside of my studio presented, you know, in a different environment. One of the painting, this is one of the paintings in the show and, um, and the title is Gossamer. I like the idea that that sort of center band is um, really sort of intricate. It feels very architectural, but also delicate and strong. So um, spider webs are, are made of gossamer. They're spun, they're mathematically beautiful. They're sort of engineeringly impossibly strong and fascinating. And so I thought that would be a good title for this painting. And um, as, as fascinating as that is, as you're sort of drawn into looking at a spider web or uh, maybe in the upper right hand corner there, you see that like red and magenta and green, almost like that's entering into uh, this, this arena, this spider web to, you know, be in this gossamer environment. Um, that's like an insect that is, is being sort of drawn in. And in the lower right, you see kind of lurking out of that uh, deep red magenta burgundy, there is that sort of sharp, almost um, 
you know, knife-like black form sort of emerging up like the shot, like the, the spider, the predator lurking in the shadow. So there's a darkness to this. There's a fascination to this. And again, like natural is about trees and nature. This is, you know, also thinking about nature and environmentalism and the, in the delicacy of like, you know, our ecosystem. This is, uh, I think the most recent painting, this is uh, 2022. And um, this painting is um, called uh, Vermeer Light. Does anyone know who Janus Vermeer is? You know your art history? That's okay, I'll show you. This is a Janus Vermeer painting. Um, I, I was visiting uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and this is, I think, a really cool painting that you have, that, that, that one, of, one of my favorite paintings that they have there. And you're like, Dion, why? What's, what's so cool about that? I'll tell you. He was really good at painting light. And um, the way that diffuse light from the window sort of spills across the wall and creates these sort of shadows, the way it's sort of warm to cool, the way there's this painting is balanced with like blues and, 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 and light sort of grays, but also these sort of rich sort of golden yellows. And, you know, while there is a woman, um, and, and objects on the table, it's more about how she's presented. It's, it's that light making the space magical. So if you see the sort of curvature in the blue of her dress, if you see the sort of light on the left side and, and transitioning across the room, I wanted to do something like that in my paintings, but I'm not gonna copy what he's painting. I'm not painting figures and you know, objects on a table like a still life but that idea of, of light transitioning and you know, some of the colors that he's incorporated there. So art history is cool and you know, it can you know, make you think about things in present day that are cool and so that's what that painting is about. This is a, a project that I have upcoming. Um, this is uh, working with some architects on this uh, it's it's going to be a, a public library, and so I was invited to um, you know do a uh, proposal for um, a mural of this sort of you know space that is um, sort of the main level of the library, and so you know it's uh, just to sort of see you know sort of how some of these ideas come about and how I get to collaborate with you know other people like like architects and in buildings and things. And this is the very last painting. Um, this was also, you know, um, recent of 2022. It's uh, 60 inches across and 40 inches tall. It is uh, titled Ascending. And um, I finished uh, this painting and um, it has a, a different feel for me and the, the way arcs and curves sort of exist differently and almost like there are these uh, parabolic vanishing points and entering into a painting from the periphery in a different way is, is sort of how it feels to me. And um, uh, my friend, uh, Connie, looked at it and, and, and she described like, oh, well, you know, I've, I've been to, um, I wanna say Santa Fe, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, where the um, hot air balloons are sort of going up and you see them all sort of like, you know, taking off at, at a similar time. And so you're sort of looking through and like seeing all these different shapes of, of curves overlapping. And I thought, oh, right, well, ascending, like, like things are, are becoming airborne. And, 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 and her description of that is, is where the title comes from. So that, that sense of like air and atmosphere and, and fascination. I believe that's all I have. The end. All right. So what <laughs> questions do we have? I'm going to pass around Mike's. First question is going to be Professor Adam Scott's probably got something good. That he's gonna ask. Are you gonna make me go all the way around up there? Hold on. <laughs> I got two mics going. I'll get the other ones going too. So who, who's got a question next after that? Hey, thanks for that great lecture, Dion. Um, so I've I just you know you have this you have you have a lot of vertical elements in your paintings, and it just seems to be something that happened early on. You know, and you're and you repeat it a lot, and um, and so part of the question is, part of it's a question, part of it's a comment. So part of the question is like, why the vert, why why the allegiance to the vertic verticality? And what's interesting is it's it tends to be verticality within a horizontal orientational often with the the canvases, 
And then the comment is what's interesting in, in your latest paintings, I was kind of, it seems like a re, so, so, you know, horizontals are, are starting to kind of make their way in there, but don't, you know, they don't seem to have the primacy still of the vertical. So that was my question. Why, what, what is the allegiance to the vertical? Why is that so, such a salient uh, part of your uh, work? It's a good question, and um, it's it's one that I think is, uh, you know, when I look at some of my influences of, like, say, Caspar David Friedrich or even um, a California painter from the Heritage Movement, Helen Lundenberg, they're really, I think, amazing at creating these horizon lines and, um, you know, these these atmospheric spaces, and that's something that's influenced me. However, I never felt as though having horizontals, there are some that are diagonal that approach horizontal or seem to be tipping off of a vertical axis, um, that I couldn't generate the energy that I wanted. Having them be vertical and having them be able to, uh, in terms of like a, a push-pull dynamic, like seem like you're looking through a doorway into another space that might be shallow, but it might be very deep. Um, that level of like fluctuation within the verticalities and having like sweeping curtains come across. I think in this image here, you sort of see some of those uh, spray applied gradients being like veils that curve in or, or, or curtains that obscure. And so having the, the tension between vertical elements still being a, a primary thing, but then having other activities interact is a, a great way to set up some of the energy that I want to have exist in the painting. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, because I, I get what you're saying about not wanting to engineer the horizontal in the actual painting itself, right? It be, maybe it becomes too leaden or becomes too heavy or something like I, yeah, that. But it's interesting that the you one of the things I've been talking to my class about and will continue to talk to my class, which is here tonight, which is a which is a in, intro to painting class, is how we occupy the rectangle you know like how how does one do that you know and how does one not only occupy it spread out in it you know uh be at home in it create dynamism within it you know all right all that stuff right and it's interesting that you're and certainly i agree like those all those verticals do that so mazel tov there and uh and <laughs> but then also but you get but you by using the canvas by using the horizontality and, and i don't think you do that i don't think it's I th i've seen i see there's vertical orientations that you use but a lot of you know like here right here it's all a lot of this kind of repeated horizontal canvas and so you get them you get kind of the best kind of have your cake and eat it too right you get the you get that landscape orientation but this still this kind of slicing upward kind of thing yeah. going on yeah it's really interesting I think that's a good way of putting it. And yeah. I, I think uh, as, um, and, and I felt a little intimidated by Curtis's intro, I had to live up to like expansion and contraction, right. and light and dark. And right. but I think that idea of, um, you know, contrasting elements, like if it's a horizontal and there is this deep receding space, but then there is this, um, you know, strong verticality that keeps fighting for your attention and coming forward and drawing you back to the surface. Right. It's, it's, it's that, um, and it's funny, I didn't say this sooner, but um, uh, I, I really like that in a painting, everything's present all at once. Yes. They don't really do anything. Uh, paintings aren't a movie where there's a beginning, middle, end. Right. Even though I'm influenced by music, there's not like a beginning, and then you listen to the chorus, and then there's some sort of fade out at the end. Everything's there all at once, which is, you know, sounds kind of stupid, like they don't do anything. However, if everything is blasting out at you at once, that's pretty dynamic. Right. And, and so to right. take advantage of like, what can a painting do in combining elements and then having viewers experience that. We have a question over here. You want to go next? Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask how, like, I, it's very interesting how you like see, you, you see like the out, like, um, you go places and then you make you make it like how do you, how do you combine those colors the colors that you see how would you do that like how do you 
balance the colors than what you see on the painting? That's a very good question. Um, my experiences of, of, of being, you know, traveling to different places, it's very intuitive. It's a very, I think, feeling sensibility of like, how do I remember something? How do I record something? Um, I think a lot of people like keep diaries. I think a lot of people are, are very talented at like how they organize their photos of experiences and, and convey ex like stories and, 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 and um, to friends and family and things like that. But for me, it, it really is intuitive and really, um, it, it's honestly not until I go back and flip through my phone that I can sometimes figure out like, what have I been looking at lately? Where, oh, that, that, that trip in Nepal was actually really influential to this painting. It's, it's very subconscious in many ways. And so I just have to pay attention really. And what I'm doing in the studio, I'm just trying to make the coolest looking paintings possible, you know, make a cool painting and it, it will mean something because you put yourself into it. And then it'll, for me, reveal itself sometimes like, oh, right. I, I was really interested looking at that painting at the Met. I, I, oh, that, that trip in Japan, really, that orange, like, flashing by me for, like, hours, that really did get into my brain, and I really did enjoy that. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. It's, it's interesting how color affects us, and sometimes, and I talk about this in my classes, too, so in my Photoshop classes, my design classes, and my photo classes, how color, sometimes we don't know how to verbalize it, right? We don't know how to and that's a good thing that we don't know how to like say sometimes how a color affects us. But what I think Dion does masterfully is say that, but in a, his way of saying it, right. We don't need to know he traveled to those places, but we feel the color, right. It's almost like we're not seeing the color and I've seen so many of his paintings and Dion and I've known each other for 23 years now. It's awesome. So I've seen his work progress. I, I'm lucky enough to own one of like an early piece where it was more illustrative, like he was showing at the start. And then I also have pieces like, I don't have some, anything this big, Dino, but, but um, then I have the newer pieces. And I, but I've seen his progression all the way through, and color has always been one of the things that's been kind of the, the tie, that, the, the thread that travels along this. And to me, it has always been about, and I like what you were kind of thinking, it's always about a physicality of color, right? Yeah. About a feeling of color, not a visual of color, but how do you feel it, right? And when you see these things in person, they really affect you. I was going to tell you guys a story. Dion and I, we go to we go to rock shows together. We go to music shows, right? I was almost going to wear my Dinosaur Junior shirt tonight, so I'm glad I didn't, so we weren't twinsies. But we go to a lot of shows together, and we went to a show a couple years ago by this band called My Bloody Valentine. They're a famous kind of uh, it's hard to explain what they're what they're like because they're not really music so much. They are. There's melodies and things, but it's a wall of sound. And and when you go see this band, and we went together and we saw this at the Shrine Auditorium. We saw one show there. They the music gets in your chest and it vibrates your body. Like you're seeing this, and it's just this this just waves of sound on you, almost like waves of color, but waves of sound. And it it affects you physically. And I remember in that show, and it's and, and there's waves of it, this like enveloping sound, and it feels like Dion's paintings, you know. And I didn't tell you that before, but that's something that I I, I was like, oh, this, you know, I know why you like My Bloody Valentine, <laughs> and visually, your paintings to me feel like My Bloody Valentine. They have this like feel of these this this pulsating waves that come at you, and I always think of his work as physical. Right. And you almost have to see it in per it's cool in slides, but you kind of almost have to see it in person in this in experience. And this is what's great about art. You know, when you're learning this, the people are in Adam's painting class, you know, it, scale helps. If the paintings are big, that help. But it doesn't have to be big to feel that physicality. It's really cool. Right. And it just can affect your body. You want if you can make art that affects people's body. And I think Dion does that. Right. He makes makes things that affect you physically. What's your question? Oh, so my question is kind of similar to what he's saying. He was talking about how you had gone from, you know, the illustrative work to mostly just color. I wanted to know what that trans transition was like. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I think it is helpful to, to start where I was uh, painting images and, and show how 
uh, color space sort of overtook that that image space. Um, but the transition was like, I feel like with imagery, with drawings and diagrams and, and all the different elements that were, you know, alluding to narratives or being fragments of, of recognizable things, those paintings felt sort of very distant, like you were looking into the paintings and the, and the paintings were sort of far away in a sense, the scale of things were like it was about sort of being drawn into a space. And I wanted to flip that around. I wanted the paintings to be, I, I, I wanted the viewer to be affected, not, not like these little like, flowers or diagrams in the painting, but I wanted you looking at it to feel the painting coming out at you. So you're uh, uh, about that color space. So really sort of flipping that around in a way and, and making them, as you were saying, it alluded to what Curtis was just saying, like physical and, and putting the viewer at the center of things. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah, one question. Are you gonna paint any like human figure, but on like, you know, like abstract per se? Oh, um, I, as a student, learned how to paint the figure. And um, as, a, as a teacher, I, I can competently sort of give examples of, of how to paint the figure. But for me, I would say the presence of my body is only maybe experienced by like you, you can understand how far my arms reach or where I'm sort of curving to make those shapes. And so there is a sense of gesture within the design of, of some of the, the, the larger sort of sweeping areas that you're seeing. Like you can think about like, you know, sort of gesturing up or as um, I think Curtis said at the beginning, like things seem to sort of reach up and stretch down. And there is a physicality to that. There are, in fact, I don't know, can I, I don't think I can zoom in, but, um, oh, I can use this. So if you see this area right here, this sort of stepped out area and this sort of curvature there, I, I honestly was thinking about how physical that feels. Um, I practice yoga and you hold poses and tension and balance. And so to sort of have yourself sort of like, on your your tiptoes but sort of like balled up and tense and having your your muscles flexed you know things like that those body sensations and gestures are in the painting hey dion <laughs> um and actually the i was going to say off of the question that was just asked uh off off of your question um that it's interesting because you know, like right now in class, we're we're taking we're kind of doing we're kind of doing a historical trajectory thing where we're starting with impressionism to start at the birth of modern painting and moving forward and around and yeah, anyway, and talking about sensation and color and material and all that stuff. And and we're also looking at Barry, a figurative painting, as a kind of parallel addendum to impressionism. Anyway, but with your, what's interesting here, and based on that last question, is that. Um, this does represent the physical. Like I feel, I have a, I have an idea that abstract painting is is actually more real than a representational painting, in that, in that these are actually the scale of your arm. Mm. You know, so when you when we paint what we're doing right now by painting, we're right now we're painting landscapes and portraits and things of that nature. We're doing we're kind of investigating that stuff. When you paint a portrait of someone on a small canvas that's a miniature, that's like a, a, re, a reduced scale version of something instantly. You know what I mean? It's not the thing. It's always a representation of the thing where I feel like abstraction and I feel definitely in the work you're doing here is actually seeking to get past a conceptual idea of a person or an object. And it's like performing the task of being human scale. Yeah, I think when 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 i'm teaching i i often i often use the the german painter gerhard richter as a reference yeah. because he makes concurrent representational and abstract paintings right. and right. his level of photorealism is so precise and breathtaking right but they're a photograph of a person and then that's a painting so it's like three steps removed from reality right where his you know, very wet into wet sort of, um, you know, scraped surfaces feel like so immediate. And so there's that 
kind of question that I'll, I'll, I'll pose to students, like, which seems more real? And there's always a conversation of like, oh, well, I kind of thought what looked like a photograph was real, but, you know, I, that, I, that, that's kind of, you know, kind of lost in translation at a point. Sure, right. Yeah, yeah so, it's just, in, it's just yeah. interesting going off the, what, what she just said about should, are figures present, are they not? Your body is present in the making of it, and then there's a recording of your body. You know, so there's a sense of the recording as or 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 like a literally a recording as painting as recording cool yeah, yeah no i think thing. paintings are a documentation of experience of their own making Absolutely. for sure for sure yeah good questions thank you guys um can you i'll get to you in a second because something just popped in my head and i'll forget it if i don't say okay so um you know since i teach photoshop right i'm teaching you know i'm i'm teaching how to do this stuff on the computer dion these look like Photoshop things. They, they look so graphic and computery. But then when you see them in person, they're not. They're beautiful, they're perfectly rendered, but you know they're paint when you see them, right? So it's, even though you don't see paint strokes, there's this wonder of how he did them, but there also is this connection to the digital world that we live in too. There is this connection to the kind of so-called perfect of digital, but yet he's painting them and so, He's got to try to make that perfection in paint, which is challenging enough and make things, I mean, these things are flawless when you see them. You like, I always try to like look for, I know I'm never going to find an imperfection, <laughs> but I'm looking for one, right? I'm not, like, let me look, no, there's not anything that's wrong with these. Can you talk a little bit about the design and Photoshop? Like, does, do you plan these things out in Photoshop? Do you, do you, how do you sketch them and get, before you get to this point, what starts these pieces? Uh, let's see. Um, so I do, I do draw in Photoshop and, and these are some of my Photoshop drawings and you can see from this one to this one, how I'm introducing ideas and thinking about color and composition. And so I do create Photoshop sketches the way that some people would sketch with color pencils or watercolor or, or graphite for that matter. Um, however, um, I can draw with color much faster on the computer. And so I kind of abandoned working with color pencils and graph paper, which I once did. So. In Photoshop, you can create the the scale that you want it to be. Like if I'm working on a painting that's for 40 inches by by 60 inches, I just set the size to be that way. And and if I make you know red shapes and some stripes and things like that after I'm done making it, I can just go in and measure like oh, so that's like a two inch stripe at the top, and then it tapers down to a point at 30 inches and doesn't go all the bottom edge. And I just put the tape where it needs to be. Um, there is this idea of that like the drawings are a bit like a blueprint um you know before a building is made you have to figure out how to build it and i think my paintings are made a lot like that i will say while i am um competent in photoshop i'm a better painter than photoshopper and i really do uh spend like enough time to get the paintings where they need or the drawings where they need to be in Photoshop, but I'm not trying to make those the perfect thing. Like there's rough edges, there's things that are sort of like cut and paste, but I can sort of like, okay, what if this red painting was like just that center part, I cut and paste that into another Photoshop file and that'll become at the left side of a, of a green painting. And then I start to change the colors in that. And so there's this way of like, immediacy and speed and like if you're you know even even driving in the car on the way here i was thinking about a bunch of things i was like oh uh what am i going to do later and i need to meet someone tomorrow and i want to be in my studio but i have this zoom meeting and, and all these sort of thoughts that are going through our heads and that's just how we have to sort of live practically but when i'm painting or thinking about drawing and painting, I, my mind is, is working that rapidly as well. And so Photoshop allows me to sort of like keep pace with how like, what if I try this? What if I tried that? Let's combine this. Let's subtract that. Yeah, cool. Did you want to add to that, Michael? Did you have a, you were talking yeah, about color covered, at the start? I think you covered a good portion of it, but I would just interested as well, do 
in the technical aspect, do you go into your coloration first? Or do you set a reflection of your experience that you form? Because your, your paintings have so much power going from the bottom up. And I would just, I was just wondering how that was. Is that a, is that a reflection of most of your paintings? You mean um, the composition from the bottom up that seems yeah, like that? If you look at your paper I'm here, I mean, I've, I've not really seen any of your photos up close in real life, but they have a, a lot of strength in the bottom uh -huh. going up. Mm -hmm. Like the spears, they're all with the spears of a, of, a, of a glass building, for the most part, the way they're formed. Because that was a reflection of glass, the way you form your colors in the center, the center portion that looks like glass. Mm. Well, I mean, a certain amount of structure, I think, is uh, being influenced by architecture and things like that. So I, I definitely would say that that is an, an element. Um, you know, I think there is this kind of like, if you're making fun of abstract painting, oh, you can turn it sideways and it looks just as good. <laughs> and, you know, I think if you if you turn my painting sideways, they feel very off balance. And that's because they are composed in a very specific way. So um, I think that's answering your question, but you also asked about color and I'm not sure if I answered that part. Oh, how I formulated my colors. Yes, yes, yes. That's a, that's a very important part of your question. I, um, it's very intuitive, and, and I, I believe um, someone on, on, um, on this side of the room asked it sort of earlier that like, how do I translate experiences into color? And, and really, I just want to make something that's sort of fascinating to me, and I'm going to try colors, and it's like, well, what if the stripe was red? It's like, okay, if that stripe is red, what if this shape is blue? And like, okay, what if the sort of gray kind of interrupts those? And there's certain things about like, you know, these are colors that I really like. I think these colors are really beautiful what sort of gray would interrupt that and, and make it uncomfortable? And like, how would that create tension? And so figuring out how colors affect other colors by trial and error, all the experience I have from making paintings up to this point is information that I have that I can be like, okay, I know how to do this, I know how to do this, let's surprise myself and, and, and explore new territory. And, and color is the main vehicle of that exploration. Good, and we have a question back here. Um, so, Two questions. Um, how do you, um, like, do you paint just according to, you know what, I feel like painting today, I'm going to paint. Do you paint, uh, you know, per, per commission or like you're going to do a gallery? Um, and then outside of that, um, how do you measure the paint that you need? Because your paintings are so large. Um, I mean, like personally, I can get pretty stingy with my paints and I run out of paint before I'm done. Mm. Um, so like, is there a specific way that you measure it or do you just kind of make a lot all at once? Good questions. Um, the, the, uh, let me start with the, the, the second question. Um, you can see, oh, I think I spun out. I don't know if I can... I lost my cursor there. I, I don't know that I can play that, unfortunately. I, I don't know what I did. But you can see, see in that picture, it's a zoom in of, of the jars that I mix color in. And acrylic paint, um, if you leave it out, it'll dry up and it's no good. But if you, if you close the lid and it's sealed right, it will last for several paintings. And if I know that I'm mixing up like matte medium and cyan, at a certain ratio, uh, I'm gonna mix more than I need knowing that I can use it or add it to another color or adjust it later. So mixing in like larger volumes is often how I work. But if I need a specific color, I sort of know not really with, um, you know, a teaspoon of this or a half a cup of that, like how much I need to mix up to, you know, make a certain area. Like if it's an off color that I might not use that often, like a, like a deep plum, like I might not wanna mix a jar of that. So there is just some experience. Like I think when I teach painting, I talk a lot about like, you know, oh, you want to mix the paint up to be like pancake syrup so you can cover the painting this way. Or, oh, you want to mix up at least, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, this amount, this ratio of, of medium to color. And it, it feels like you're giving recipes. And you just sort of learn that as you go. Like I think as, as someone who's very, you know, experience in, in kitchen or baking or things like that. So, but I never feel like, I mean, if I scrape paint off or I get something wrong and I take like 
a, a, a fistful of cotton balls and wipe away all this paint because it didn't look right. I didn't get the color right on the stencil. I have to like get rid of it before it dries. I don't really feel like I wasted anything because I made the decision to remove something to make it better. And I had to use that paint to get it to be a finished painting anyways. And that was just part of the process. So it's not about like, I know paint's expensive, you know, <laughs> I spent hundreds of dollars on it. But at the same time, I didn't want to make something that was like, well, I was just trying to, you know, save some, some money there and I made a less important painting. So you, all that kind of weighs in. Does that answer your question? Okay. Part one of the question was, do I paint when I feel like it? Do I paint for commissions? Do I paint for galleries? All those reasons, I kind of want to paint all the time. I kind of feel like most myself, it's, 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 it's a very fun, it's a very satisfying, fulfilling activity to be painting in my studio and doing things. And I'm very fortunate to have exhibitions or, or galleries that want to work with me. And so that kind of dovetails nicely. Uh, occasionally I do commissions. The mural that I showed you was specifically a commission. I didn't just go up to a parking garage and say, you know what, I'm going to put my painting there. Someone had to ask me to do it, and that's how that happened. So I would say all of the above on those, and I say make art when you feel like it is a good idea, but I think a better idea is to be in your studio or your creative space, whatever that might be, for regular scheduled hours, because you never know when you'll you'll make a breakthrough, or you know, just like sitting and staring at something, you'll figure something out, you know. Um, and you maybe didn't do something, but you had an idea come in to your brain, and it's like, okay, that's what I'm going to paint next. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I mean, you know, all of our students, young college students here and on YouTube, you know, when you're making art, just kind of piggybacking on what Dion's saying. I think it's very important that you hear that from an artist. It, he's not treating it like, it's something he wants to do all the time because it's fun and he loves it. But sometimes you have to know that you have to, be able, you have to make work in times where you might not feel like making work, right? So you set up parameters for yourself to kind of almost force yourself to be there. Once you're there though, you're experiencing and you're, you know, you're doing something that maybe you wouldn't have done if you only felt like it, right? So if you only, you only make art when you feel like it, the chances are you're not always going to make good work, right? Because the, where he's finding those new experiences are probably when he was least expecting it. So if you're just waiting for that moment to occur, you're kind of screwed, right? You kind of have to have a studio practice. This is what Professor Adam Scott's talking to you guys about. Yeah. And then there's also just repetition. The only way that you get 20 five years later of making work and making this kind of body of work is you do it a lot. Going back to yours about what, how much paint do you know how to, well, because he's been doing it for a long time and you make a lot of mistakes. He's thrown out a lot of things, right? We're seeing the perfect ones. We're seeing the ones that worked, but there's also the ones that didn't work. And that the ones that the paint, there was too much paint, too little paint, not in it, right? Didn't get it right. And he's got it right. And you hit it, you get on something and you hit it. But sometimes those moments in the studio where you screw up will put you on a trajectory that's powerful that you didn't see unless you were there doing it, right? So that, having that studio practice is super important. Spending that time, we don't, it's tough. But everybody in this room, I'm guessing, feels like they're an artist, right? And that's right there is the start. That's it. If you feel like you're an artist, then you are one because <laughs> Not everybody feels like an artist if you feel like it. So then it's about setting up parameters for yourself. And that's what Dion has been doing for a long time. So then he knows how much paint to use. He knows what mistakes are going to come up. He knows how hot or cold. Listen, I've been into a studio. It's perfect. Like the temperature, like there's like the air can't move too much in there because if it does, it might make the paint act differently and bubble up. Right? It might do things that he doesn't want us to do. So he's, he can control the whole space, but that's because he's in there interacting with it all the time. Um, Other questions before we thank Dion for being here. It's wonderful, just, awesome. Just yeah. one thing that uh, Curtis reminded me and, and kind of also answers your question in a different way is um, uh, Steph Curry, you know, he makes a lot of three pointers. He practiced a lot, right? And, and I think being in the studio as, as often as you can, I'm a better painter for it. So, you know, it relates to other things, other professions, other activities, you know, like making three pointers.
do it over and over and over again, and you're gonna, you, look, nobody got worse from practicing more. I say this all the time <laughs> in my class. Nobody got, I practiced a lot and I got worse. What? <laughs> you <really> suck. <laughs> like, how did that happen? Right? Oh, I shot a thousand three pointers today and I got worse. Uh, okay, I don't know. Some, I made a thousand paintings this year and I got worse. I don't think so. I think you got better, right? So that's the thing. Sometimes it's just, it's sheer quantity sometimes of just like doing it. And then you're going to hit on things that are exciting and that, that make sense and build that story that you're trying to tell, whatever that is. Well, thank you so much, Dion, for coming out. I think it was spectacular for students to hear. And thank you guys for all those great questions and comments. It's awesome to get that interaction. Um, you know, for artists, it's good to have this dialogue with each other, right? It's not just about Dion, you know, telling us what he does, but it's about a dialogue that we have together, right? This is a, when we're making art, it's also about a collaborative experience that we share together. Otherwise, nobody makes art. He doesn't just make art in a studio and then see you later, right? He wants to, he wants to have that experience with other people. So I appreciate you guys coming out and our people on YouTube. Thank you for watching us on YouTube. This video will be up on YouTube so you can rewind and watch back and see your question that you asked. You guys all ask great questions. So thank you, Dion. Appreciate it. And we'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you so much.